Okay, so today we will discuss rasterization, an important step in forward rendering pipeline. Uh, and this topic is dealt with uh, in these settings. So we have the projections that have moved us from 3D to all the way down to 2D viewports. Uh, and now that we are in 2D, we still have a continuous scene because everything we have dealt with are continuous to objects. We have ideal surfaces or curves and uh, everything uh, is defined that way. But when we want to render it on an image plane, which is basically an array of uh, pixels, we need to discretize it. So this rasterization is all about discretization of the continuous 2D primitives we have in our hand after the uh, after their journey from 3D to 2D. Uh, so again, the display device has this 2D array, uh, 2D array of pixels uh, or rasters or cells. Uh, they go with these names. We are familiar with pixels, but still, uh, they can be also referred as rasters, cells of uh, cells. Uh, yeah, so this process is then called rasterization or pixelization or even scan conversion. Uh, and we will do that today. The primitives are essentially points, lines, and uh, triangles. We, we will have these three primitives. Uh, so using them, we can construct any complex shape, like a curve, for instance, a one-dimensional object, a curve. Uh, you can make it as a set of connected line segments. And points are just basic points. You don't even connect anything. You just put some color to a pixel. Uh, and although not distant here, maybe it is because it is not the simplest, the more complex primitive that we still need is the triangle. Okay, so I mentioned it here. Uh, and triangle is necessary. So you can draw multiple lines inside of a triangle to draw it, but there, there are better algorithms that deal directly with triangles. So the primitives we will be dealing with are points, lines, and triangles, and that's all. Curves are just a set of line segments. Polygons, you can break any polygon into triangles. Actually, for a polygon of n vertex, you will always have n minus two triangles in its uh, triangulation. Uh, and yeah, so basically everything boils down to triangles if you have a surface of a polygon mesh, you will still have triangles in the end. That's why it will be enough to learn rasterization of triangles. And for even simpler primitives, you, we will also learn line and points. So rasterization is then converting output primitives uh, yeah. into frame buffer updates. So frame buffer is the buffer that populates our display uh, so, uh, and deciding on the correct cells of the frame buffer is the task of rasterization with co correct values. Um, so please choose which pixels contain which intensity value. Okay, so we will choose the pixels as well as the uh, color values on those pixels. So this, this is the task of rasterization. And we have some constraints like straight lines should be appearing as straight. Uh, and the endpoints are very critical. We must respect them. Uh, and other than the endpoints, we must also respect the intermediate points. So the color or other values should be consistent throughout the primitive. And also we want this st step rasterization to be extremely fast as we will be dealing with that a lot for each primitive, we will run this. Uh, so that's why one idea 
to do this is move it all the way to the GPU where you have a parallel architecture and you can render each primitive in parallel because they are totally independent of each other. They fit very well to the GPU architecture. That's why we uh, see this rasterization step uh, as a non-programmable unit in a GPU. The pro programmable units of GPU are vertex shaders and fragment shaders, as you know. So the uh, rasters or pixels decided by the non-programmable rasterization fit uh, the frame buffer. So if I draw it nicely, we have vertex shader, which is programmable. This essentially transforms your vertices to the correct locations on the 2D viewport. So we are in 2D now. Then rasterization is all about 2D. So in 2D, we draw stuff, we rasterize them. In, in, in other words, we decide on the pixels that are inside the primitives. Or if it's a line, then there is no inside, then we decide on the pixels that are on the line. And if it is a point, then we don't really decide anything. Uh, it is obvious. Anyway, so vertex shader, this is the GPU architecture, by the way. This is about transformations. Then comes the rasterization. This is programmable. This is non-programmable. Every algorithm here are predefined and you have no say in it. And it is good that way. It can be implemented fastly because it doesn't expect anything from you. Then these pixels, these rasters, go to the fragment shader. And so and so we so the fragment shader we also feed in some normal information, etc., to do a proper shading. So we uh, can make it that way. Uh, Okay, so and yeah, GPU architecture is that that a programmable fragment shader can decide on cool color values of each pixel coming from the rasterizer. Okay, so let's see the rasterization algorithms then. The first one it deals with uh, the line primitive. So as you know, a line can be parameterized using two parameters m the slope. Uh, so the angle it makes with the horizontal axis uh, and B is the Y intercept. So when X is zero, whatever you have is the B. So one way to draw a line, a simple way is actually you sample the line continuously, uniformly uh, on Y axis. So if so that would be this example here. If the line has a big slope, like bigger than one, which would be this. By the way, slope is y difference over x difference, right? This is the slope equation. So the horizontal, the line, the less the slope is. Uh, so here, for m less than one, I have this line more close to horizontal. So in this case, we for each x, so we increase x uniformly one by one. And then we decide on the y value by feeding it into this function. Or if the slope is bigger than one, like more verticalish lines, then we sample along the y axis uniformly. So we increase y one by one, one, two, three, four, five. And then we feed that y value into this equation, which is the rewritten version of this equation. And we learn our x and plug it here and round it to the integer, and that would be our x. So this algorithm, also uh, uh, known as, I think actually there is no special name to it apparently. Uh, so all you do is, without loss of generality, I can assume that, uh, I, can, I will be assuming the horizontalish lines that have slope less than one and positive. So that will be 
lines of this shape, then it fits into this department, increment X uniformly, increase X uniformly. So essentially X goes from one, which is the sale point. So actually ideal line starts from 0 0.5 apparently here and 1.91. So it is this point exactly in my red uh, laser pointer. But of course we need to round it up to the closest X value as I will increase the X values. So then 0 0.5 goes to one. So that is your first pixel. When you plug in this original X, uh, this X, sorry, one to your equation, which is this, by the way, where is the equation? Uh, this is the equation. Uh, y equal to, uh, uh, you, you get this too, and you then round it up to a uh, regular two. So actually I put, this is the first, then when X is two, uh, the y we get would be this, and it gets rounded up to three. Then I have 0 0.02, which is again three, and 3.3 .3 is again three. So these consecutive trees are from these three uh, stuff. Then 3.7 rounds up to four, so you increase. But x's are just increasing one by one. Yeah, a very basic algorithm. Uh, the problem with that is there will be too many floating point operations. So for every step, I execute this MX plus B operation, which involves this uh, multiplication, as well as some addition. And all these are floating point entities, X, M's, Y, V. Uh, and round operation is also very problematic, actually very basic, but if you, you will be doing this millions of times per frame, for the simplest lines. So round is also some extra cost. That's why we will now improve on this uh, using an algorithm called DDA, Digital Differential Analyzer. In this case, the idea is actually, instead of evaluating this function at every step independently, we use prior step. So we use history uh, and we just add some delta difference to our previous result and get the new result and so we will be getting rid of uh, uh, the multiplication basically so basically the idea is the following multiplying and rounding is slow as discussed so it's when you are here and again without those of generality i am assuming this uh, positive slope line so at every step y should increase so you should either go from here to one level up, or you should stay at the same level, which I call east or northeast. Okay, so again, this is for this slope. You will be implementing different versions of this for different slope of lines and call it by just looking at your M value in the beginning. So I will be sticking with this slope. So what we do is actually uh, the difference is essentially this. I have X value uh, and in the next step, I will have X plus one value. So my Y value of the next step is an X plus one plus B. Okay, so this part, normally I use MX plus B, but X in the next step will be X plus one and B doesn't change. So this is the new Y and this is the old Y. So you subtract the old from new to get the difference D. So if the difference is big enough, which is this again, y nu minus y, uh, if it is big enough, then you go one level up. If not, you stay at the same level. So to be more clear, uh, for instance, then the difference is uh, 0.3, you are at y, so I think this would be here. And in the next step, the when you take this difference uh, the value would be 0.5 bigger than 0.5 so then you have to go one step up uh, 
so think of it like this. So you are above this line. So in the above this point. So in the next step, you go one step up. But now you are below. So stay in the same level. Um, uh, so again, below or equal, stay in the same level. Here, this is higher than you. So uh, you will not be able to satisfy this line on this level anymore. So go one level up. That is the intuition. Uh, and whenever you go one level up, which is equal to y equal to y plus one, you have to uh, reload your difference. By reload, I mean you reduce it back uh, because you are getting rid of the accumulation. So you kind of resetting the D and you start by adding new stuff to D. Uh, so you, you will be working on the new D uh, if some level up takes place. Otherwise, you just increase X and increase D as well. Uh, and notice that X and Y here are already integers. So they are exposed to plus one operations only. So you don't have to do any rounding uh, further. Uh, yeah. So this is faster than directly running this equation at every step independently uh, because there is no floating point operations. Uh, but there will be some round of errors uh, because we are after this point we are resetting uh, and so we are kind of preventing error accumulation here but still there will be some error accumulation uh, so that's why this algorithm is not really recommended what we will be using is called midpoint line algorithm that is also uh, very accurate and robust and it's uh, other version, similar version is called Bresenham's algorithm. They are very similar. Actually, they produce the same results. Um, uh, and they can also be extended to circle perimeters. Uh, but this midpoint line algorithm is actually easier to discuss. That's why I will stick with this. And I will also mention the idea of this afterwards. But now let's focus on the midpoint line algorithm, where the idea is find out if the midpoint between your next step, east or northeast decision, is above or below the ideal line. So what I mean by this, I will be again assuming this kind of horizontal lines in zero one interval. Uh, by the way, for the other slopes, bigger than one slopes, you will just exchange the role of X and Y. So implementation wise, it is uh, nothing uh, difficult. It is very simple extension. That's why we will just stick with this case only, which is this case. And this case just naturally happens because essentially you will just replace all X's with Y's and vice versa to get this case. So in this, uh, I'm less than one case. I have this decision based on the midpoint of the two candidate pixels. So I am here in the next step, thanks to my slope, I know that I will be either at the same level east or I will go one step up northeast. And the decision is based on the midpoint of east and northeast. So that is why I call we call this midpoint line algorithm. So if the ideal line if the midpoint is below the ideal line, then it means ideal line is closer to any, so you have to choose any. In other words, you have to increase your y of the next dot. However, so this is the case we see here, but the line can also be uh, like this. Um, still, then m is above the ideal line, so you have to choose east for the next uh, point in the line. Okay, so then, but I, the biggest question here is how do I decide whether a given point is above or below a line? I need a function that gives me a negative value if the given point 
to that function is below the line and it gives me a positive value if it is above the ideal line and if it gives me just zero if it is right on the line so what is f then f is actually uh, let's try to derive s f the function i will be using is this actually y minus mx plus v okay uh, so here is that function for my example uh, in this case m is 0 0.4 and b is 0 so when you plug this point so is this point above this line yes so it should return positive right okay so then let's plug uh, three here three minus three times something 0 0.4 minus zero so don't consider this for this case yeah so three times minus three times something less than one so it will be positive definitely so what if i what happens to the sign as i go in this direction what happens is y is always three because i will be in this level so this part is always fixed y m is fixed for the line and x is increasing kindly so when you are right here this location this function will return zero because uh, you will be exactly on the line and like when you continue your journey again remember this line is uh, big uh, so like if you extend this line so you are somewhere here so this point is below this line right so when you plug a very big x here like uh, 99 or something it will be still subtracted from the little tree so it will be negative then this function really makes sense to use okay so the function i will be using for the midpoint line algorithm is this then y minus mx minus b let's rewrite this function m is y difference over x difference and b is b so let's multiply all sides by minus dx then i have plus dyx from here minus dxy from here and plus dxb from here okay and it's still zero so your function is then ax plus by plus c where a is dy b is minus dx and c is dxb okay so this is my function now let's come back to the algorithm now that i have this cool function that gives me the proper values for a given query point x y i will use the midpoint as my query points right so i am currently at this x p y p location so then the midpoint of the next step is definitely be this because of my line slope so it will be one incremented version of xp and it will be 0 0.5 up version of yp again since this is midpoint you have to go only 0 0.5 unit not one unit so let's call this value d okay fm uh, and where midpoint is xp plus one comma yp plus 0 0.5 uh, so this let's rewrite this function uh, remember uh, a times the x whatever it is plus b times y whatever it is plus c so we have the d then so remember if d is zero then m is above the line which is not the case here so if d is negative then m is below the line so you have to choose any then now we decided on east or northeast okay and now i have one more thing to do what will be my decision variable d next step i don't want to execute this uh, thing because it involves multiplications floating point operations so what i do is uh, if i consider e i look at the second midpoint the two level later midpoint i call it m prime if e is selected m prime will be this 
and if northeast is selected, M prime will be this. Okay, so let, let's discuss these two cases. So when E is selected, uh, which happens when midpoint is uh, above the ideal line, uh, not below, so not this case, but it happens with this case. M is selected like this. So how do I select uh, the, how, how do I update the D, the decision variable uh, for the next step then? I don't want to evaluate everything from scratch. I want to use the previous D and add something to that. So what is that something? Again, I use the second midpoint according to the case, which is M prime. What is M prime in terms of XP? You have to go two steps and 0 0.1 step up, two step right and 0 0.1 step up. That gives you this D new value. But again, I will not be making all these operations that includes floating points, etc. What I do is I will subtract alt D, which is this using this little M, not M prime. All the alt d from the new d. So if you subtract this equation from this equation, I already did it for you. You will just end up with this little value. So you don't really have to do all these additions, multiplications. All you need to do is add this delta d uh, to the alt d. So we constant and dy is constant by the way. This is the difference in y in your line ideal line equation. So you will be adding this constant value to the current D value to get the next D value instantly. Okay, so that is that. How about uh, the second case? Remember, I can either select East or Northeast. So I have two cases. I have dealt with the selection of East. Now, if I select the Northeast case, i.e. Uh, my midpoint is below the ideal line, then uh, the next D I will be using when I come here will be decided based on M2 prime. So what is M2 prime? You need to go two level right plus two and one and a half level up. One up here and half up here. So three point over two is one and a half. Yeah, so that is your new D to get there from here. But I already know how to go from here to here using D alt. So I subtract D alt from D new, and I end up with this constant again, which is dy minus dx. Before it was just dy. Now it is dy minus dx, but still constant because dy and dx are completed only once in the very beginning using the ideal line equation. This is the y difference of endpoints. This is the x difference of endpoints. And you will be adding this value to the alt D to get to new D. If you are currently in this northeast scenario. Again, if you are in this east scenario, this is the dy is the delta to be added to the old d. And everything is ready actually. I will also give you the pseudocodes here. Don't worry about it to wrap it up. But there is one little technical detail that we have to consider uh, is that we need to eliminate the division to stay completely in integer arithmetic. Remember, uh, the whole point is to get rid of the floating point arithmetic of the DDA, Digital Differential Analyzer algorithm. Uh, so, and we still unfortunately have uh, some divisions uh, like here. Uh, um, in the beginning, actually, where there is no D new to be subtract where there is no D old to be subtracted from D new. So initially, essentially, what you have to do is you start at this X0, Y0 location. Then your midpoint or your decision variable D is X0 plus one, go to right one cell and go up half cell. It gives you this function. Uh, which is this rewritten, rewritten version. And this little part can be re rewritten as zero because 
x0, y0 is already on the ideal line for sure. Then this is zero by the definition of f. So I have a plus b over two. But again, there is, for my initial d, for the very beginning, I need a plus b over two. Uh, remember a was dy and b was minus dx. So even if I plug them here, uh, I will have this division, unfortunately, which will add this uh, division, floating point arithmetic to my system, just for the initialization. So very tiny, but unfortunate detail. But I can get rid of this tiny detail by multiplying everything by two, actually very nice trick. Uh, then your D start will be two dy minus dx. Two dy is not really a multiplication. You just have dy plus dy, addition of two, same thing. Uh, and everything is integer now. So to, to get that, I need to multiply everything by two. Uh, then your ax by c function is actually two times ax plus by plus c, which will still be zero if x, y is on the point, which will still be negative if x, y is below the ideal line, because something negative, you double it, it will still be negative. Similarly, it will still be positive if x, y is above the ideal line, because something positive, you multiply by two, it will still be positive. So it doesn't uh, affect the output structure of R, V, R, F function. So again, the trick is to get rid of this floating point arithmetic division, I will multiply everything by two. Then this uh, dy we mentioned in the beginning is actually two dy. Remember, we decide on this dy value for each scenario, it will be two dy. And this dy minus dx delta will be just two times that. And similarly, uh, I have this two multiplication, two dy minus dx, so multiply this thing by two and minus dx. And that is the only trick we have to do. And now we have no floating point operations at all. What we do is we start with x, y. Uh, and I we sample x one by one because of the nature of our line, horizontalish line less than one slope. So x plus plus x plus plus it will definitely happen no matter what your case is. Uh, but if you are at this case where the decision variable is zero, so less than zero, which means your uh, m is below the ideal line, less than zero. So actually it is this case. Then you have to increase your y as well, which will move you from this point to the northeast point. Okay. And if you do that, you will be using northeast delta increment, which is just this constant, this constant. Otherwise, line is more horizontal at that location, you will be adding more thing, more nothing to y. So y stays the same. In other words, you will stay in the east part, not northeast part. So you will be using east update. And so is it really worth it to be that smart to get rid of the floats and use midpoint line algorithm instead of the very simple digital differential analyzer DDA or even the extremely that simple uh, naive algorithm where you literally plug in the current X uh, and whatever floating point you have, you get the rounded version of it. So is it really worth it to be that smart to separate into these cases and implement this uh, less trivial algorithm? Yes, actually, it is that it is still worth it even at this time, as this uh, experiment suggests, a million of lines are drawn and they are really long lines. Uh, and what we, the observation is the basic algorithm DDA. 
taking seven seconds, whereas the optimized algorithm with midpoint is about the half. So it is twice faster. So it still makes a difference then. Okay, so then this example, I recommend you to uh, run your uh, midpoint line algorithm and land onto these pixels. Uh, yeah, so accuracy wise, by the way, so if you look at the pattern here, two uh, diagonal, two and two horizontal, three or four diagonal, three horizontal, and none. So let's look at like this two, two, three, two, two. So two, two, three, two, two. Is it the same as? The output we see here two, two, three, two, two. Yeah, actually, it is the same output as the DDA or even the naive algorithm gives. Uh, so, even if some accumulation may occur here, we still have this output. Uh, and yeah, so. But the speed is definitely on our side if we uh, stick with the midpoint line algorithm as shown here in seven versus three case as shown here. And resonance algorithm is very similar. So the uh, like implementation wise, it is more trickier actually. So and discussion of this is also more challenging. So, but I let me just give you the idea then. Uh, the idea is you need to choose the pixel closest to the ideal line. Okay, choose the pixel closest to the ideal line. So we normally, in the midpoint algorithm, we uh, we look at the midpoints location with respect to the ideal line. Now in Brazilian, we look at the pixels situation with respect to the ideal line, and then uh, equations get different a little bit so let me extend the midpoint line algorithm to midpoint to the midpoint circle algorithm uh, first of all and this is also a good example to demonstrate the error accumulation stuff uh, so with eda based approach what you can do is you can plug in the next x value as you increase x one by one and you read the uh, output y value so you say y is equal to square root of r square minus x square right uh, so it is a nonlinear function when x is small the separation is small but as, as you are at big x's the separation will be larger so your next point will have a significant decrease difference in the y output, which is uncool. That's why we don't want to just evaluate this expression naively at every step independent in an independent way. It is also slow. So, but midpoint circle algorithm is very cool here. Uh, let's focus on only this octant. Okay, I have eight octants. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And I will be only uh, working on this octant because when you decide on this pixel, x, y, you can get it symmetric by just negating y. And then you can get this point symmetric counterpart by negating only the x component. And then you can get this point by negating the uh, y components. So one, two, three, four is already done. And again, once you are here, you can also get this component right how can you do that you swap x and y uh, and you also take the negation then once you are here uh, so this comes from dot product by the way once you are here you do the same to so go from here to here you negate the second component and from here to here you negate the first uh, 
component and from here to here you negate the second component so if i can somehow draw points in the second octant i will be effectively drawing all the points actually yeah like this so if you draw it you can use symmetry to draw all other uh, points now what is algorithm then very similar to the midpoint line algorithm actually uh, what we have here is uh, i now need to change my f function the decision function it needs to give zero if x y is on the circle the blue region it needs to give me a negative value if it is in the circle, the orange region, and it needs to give me a positive value if x, y is outside the circle, the green region. So then just use the line uh, circle equation, circle of radius r, and circle whose center is in 0, 0 center origin. So this is my x, f, x, y then. Then comes the very similar logic but, in, but instead of east and northeast i will be dealing with east and southeast here because i am in the second octant i start from here and x is zero so let's look at the big picture you will be starting from here x zero and x1 x2 x3 x4 etc all the way up to x something so assume that you are here this is your x p y p in the next step, you can either be at this level east, or you can go one level down, which is southeast. So, if the uh, midpoint is inside the circle, which is the case here, then it means that you are the, uh, the ideal circle is this, and midpoint is inside the circle. So east is more closer to the ideal circle. So you select east. And if it is outside, which is not shown here, then you have to select the opposite. So like this, if you are somewhere here, assume you are at this level, then your midpoint is outside the circle. So you have to select the south version because you are already inside. Uh, the midpoint is outside means that you are closer to the uh, ideal line. The south version is closer to the ideal line. So let's implement this idea then. Um, we actually, we have already, this is the idea. So let's implement the same trick we did with the line. I don't really want to evaluate all these squares, uh, slopes, etc. Uh, to get my new D, my decision variable, what I do instead is I will subtract the old D that I have used while using this midpoint and the new D, the second step, second level later step, uh, the D here, this is I call D new for this decision minus the decision of my immediate the next level gives me the increment I will do. Okay, so then this, if I decided on east, which is the scenario here, right? Because midpoint is in the circle, so uh, east is closer to the ideal line, I will select east. Since I will be selecting this in the next step, I will be dealing with this east and this southeast. So the midpoint would be this, which is with respect to XP, YP, it is two step right and one step down, uh, 0 0.5 step down. Okay, plus one minus 0 0.5. So with the, the new, using these two updates, plus two and minus 0 0.5 updates is this. And the D for the immediate, the next update with respect to M is this, uh, essentially you have, uh, xp plus one and yp minus 0 0.5 to come here which gives you this weird equation and when you subtract this from this new weird equation it just boils down to this very cool expression two times xp plus three so that would be your delta to be updated to be added to the current d 
to get your next thing. And similarly, if you decide on southeast, okay, so in other words, your it looks like this. See my cursor, it would be better, but using PowerPoint on Mac has these problems, unfortunately. So it really will be that difficult to go to the pen, but it's also annoying. I think I will not be able to do that. So sorry about that. But if the blue line was like this, okay, assume it, imagine it like this, then I select this southeast when I was at this step. For the next step, I have to go here. So since I am here now, in the next step, I can either go here or here. So your M2, M2 prime will be this then, okay? So how to go here? Move two units, right? And one and a half unit down, okay? Two, right, plus two and minus one and a half down. Yeah, so, and with that logic, this is my new D. Uh, don't worry, I will not evaluate this because I will subtract this from that D and I will just end up with this uh, cleaner, nicer equation. That is my update to the old D to get the new D. And again, we need to ready to give the full algorithm, but I need the initialization. So initialization is X is zero and Y is radius. Again, why? Because I am dealing with this octant. So I will start here. What is this point? X is definitely zero. And Y value is also special here. It is equal to your radius. You have to go from origin to the top, hence R. So that is your initial point. And with respect to this point, your next point is zero plus one is one. And R minus half is R minus half. Uh, and with that, if you plug it into your a function for the decision variable again if this is uh, inside negative then you are in so you have to select uh, east and if this is positive then you are out so you have to select southeast but this thing has a floating point arithmetic unfortunately five over four right i can get rid of this with a trick similar to the uh, multiplication of two trick we have seen in the midpoint line algorithm. Uh, so the trick is essentially this. So I, I, I will show the trick later actually in a second. First, without the trick, the algorithm will be this simple actually. Uh, again, based on your current decision value, if it is negative means that you are inside, M is inside, so it is this case nice. So E is closer to the ideal circle. So you will select E and so you will do the E update, which is two X plus three as driven here, two X plus three. Uh, and definitely you will increase X by one because you are in the second octant and X just increases uniformly. Uh, and otherwise you are in the Southeast department. So you will have the different update rule. And since you are in the Southeast, you will go to the southeast for the south effect you have to go one y down so you have additional y minus minus for east plus plus is fine for south you also have to take one down take y one down and since these are integers you don't have any round of errors and any round operations this is extremely fast and that would be your second quant drawing then with symmetry you will extend it to all uh, the core, core octants like this so you essentially uh, took care of this octant then i think they show it on this pixel or for the green case by symmetry you will draw this green then this green then this green and then this green you can go from here to here right uh, all you need to do is to swap X and Y, and then do the same from here, go here, from here, go here, and from here, go here. These are just sign flips. And let's finish the algorithm with the trick. I need to get rid of 
5 over 4, which is a floating point number. Uh, so I need to stay completely with the integers. Uh, and to do that, 1 minus r works for me. OK, so then I will be subtracting 1 minus 4 from everything. So in other words, I will use uh, I will use one minus four less version of D and I call it the big D. Okay, so if you subtract one minus one over four from this, this just becomes one, one minus R then. Okay, one minus R. And similarly, you have to subtract those stuff uh, from here as well. Uh, and you will be using this new D now, not the old D. It is still a decision variable, but a different uh, updated version. Yeah, so that completes our primitive uh, drawing uh, line, primitive drawing when primitive is line. I will also talk about triangle drawing or triangle rasterization. And this is important because every polygon can be decomposed into a set of triangles, like this guy or these polygons, etc. So your input is three 2D points that are the triangle vertices in pixel space. I will call them x0, y0, x1, y1, x2, y2. And at every point, I will have also maybe some parameter values, like color values. It can be any dimensional. For color RGB, it will be three-dimensional, but here it shows it as n-dimensional features for the zeroth vertex, first vertex, and the second vertex. So one, two, three, three vertices here. And you will be interpolating the parameter values inside, like the colors inside color values, and also you will be interpolating the locations x0, y0, uh, and you will get your inside point x, y. Okay, so this is the uh, input-output relationship of triangle rasterization. And this is the visualization of what I just said. I have three points x0, y0, x1, y1, x2, y2, with features q0 to Q0n, and similarly for Q1, Q2. And fragments are also known as pixels. I will be creating these black, so I will be classifying these pixels as important inside pixels. So this is essentially a classification problem. And in addition to announcing these pixels, you will also give some values to these pixels some color values, typically. Here is the simplest algorithm. You consider the bounding box of this triangle using the min x, max x, and min y, max y. Then you draw this scan line and consider all these dots and make an inside test. So then, uh, you already have the ideal triangle here, and uh, we have we will see uh, inside test. Actually, we have seen point inside triangle test, and then we discussed ray tracing in the way beginning. But still, uh, I think in the slides I will uh, repeat them here. Yeah. So from here, three points come, three comes, and four or five points comes here, etc. Every scan line gives you a set of points, essentially. And yeah, so your, you get your x5 points. And this is all about the uh, function value updates. Uh, and there are ways to do those updates. Uh, so then the functions are colors. So I will show you the barycentric way of doing this, which is the easiest and most commonly used and quickest way to do that. So uh, what you have here is you have a coordinate system for triangles. A point P will be represented by sum of a point A, sum of a point 
3 and sum of a point C. These sums are weights. Alpha weight, think the A point using alpha param par parameter and beta for B point and gamma for C point. And the trick is their sum must be one, which enable, which ensures that the point is on the same plane as the plane of this switch, this triangle. And then I also want them to be positive, which ensures that the point, although it is in the same plane of this triangle, which is, which may be like here, it then ensures that this is inside. Okay, so you have these two conditions. And to get your alpha, beta, gamma, you essentially make for the beta, for instance, this area. So for this point, you create these uh, triangles, as we discussed before, uh, and their areas are like uh, for beta, we will be using this area over the entire area. Uh, yeah, so for instance, when P is somewhere here, then this area will be smaller, uh, then the weight of B will be decreasing because you are far away from B, right? So this is the stuff we covered. That's why I'm very quick here. Uh, but instead of running your area formula, there is a quicker way to get these parameters alpha, beta, gamma, and it is uh, you write these equations for x component, which is the uh, weighted average of the x part of the one, two, three points, and the y uh, point, you write it in terms of y, so you have two equations and three unknowns, looks pessimistic, but if you uh, look carefully, uh, the sum of these three will be one. So you actually have only two points, two unknowns. So you get rid of lambda three by setting lambda three equal to one minus lambda one and minus lambda two. So you have two equations, two unknowns, then you can run your favorite linear system solver and get your alpha, beta, gamma, which are known as lambda one, lambda two, lambda three here. Now, then the algorithm is this. You get your, for each pixel, x, y, you get your alpha, beta, gamma. Again, I recommend you to get it using this simple derivation, but there's also other ways to do that. Anyway, you can get it. And then your test is they must be bigger than all parameters must be bigger than one. Uh, and uh, the derivation here ensures that their sum is one. Uh, then this condition ensures that this is an inside pixel, like, like this pixel, okay? Like, I don't know, this pixel, okay? Then you have to interpolate something. So, uh, for instance, x, y, uh, for the x, y point, you get your new color by getting this alpha amount from the fixed vertex zero color and this amount of vertex one color and this amount of vertex two color. And that gives your rasterized triangle with cool colors. Mm. Yes. And uh, without barycentric, you can uh, come back to your scanline conversion algorithm, but instead of using the bonding box and going through all the pixels here, like all these pixels as well, you can be uh, traversing this space better uh, by using slope information. So if you are here, uh, this is inside, so you go up, uh, so you go up here and whenever in the next step, this pixel is outside completely, so you don't go up further. Mm -hmm. Similarly, when you go right, you will not be going right further because of these uh, pixels. So you cut it before. And uh, we have, so this is the now kind of a wrap up from now on. Uh, I have drawn this uh, before with pencil here but this is the vertex shader for mm -hmm. vertex transformation, programmable unit, then the rasterization, 
that gives you the primitives, the pixels to be drawn, and then the fragment shader to colorize the pixels. Uh, so for the depth, uh, so in, in this last step, fragment shader step, uh, we need to populate the frame buffer. And the frame buffer is about colors, uh, but also it is about some masking operations as well as some depth operations. So the depth buffer is important uh, because uh, we have Z values and we, we, we need to uh, we need to make it uh, make a proper drawing here. So a paint the painter's algorithm puts everything in order. So if you first draw this, then the floor, then the trees. So if there is an order, then this works fine. But sometimes the order is impossible to define. So here, for instance, in a case like this, so it doesn't work. Uh, but this algorithm actually is used even in games. It's where you have used some other structures to define some certain order. Uh, but nowadays, it is not really recommended due to this ambiguity of ordering. Uh, so what we really recommend is the depth buffer test where we maintain a separate buffer in addition to the frame buffer that puts that stores color values. So here I have uh, my distance to the camera. The less it is, the closer it is to the camera. So it should be seen then. So then actually, initially, this is your depth buffer, nothing on it. When you draw this uh, object, great triangle, uh, you put the depth values of the corresponding pixels here. Later, when a separate triangle is drawn, for instance, for this point, apparently this is closer to the camera. So it has a smaller value, like four maybe. And four versus the corresponding value here is five. Four is smaller, so you keep the smallest one. So in your frame buffer, you use the yellow color and you update your depth buffer as well. Put a four here because later maybe I will get a two that will also defeat this two, this four. Uh, but maybe I will have a 4.5, then it will not be defeating this four. So you have to update the depth buffer as well at every step. And this is talking about that. Uh, so the, and by default, we put the depth into zero one range. Remember, after all the transformations, we already put the Z value, uh, that component into minus one and one, just like the other X, Y components. So uh, we can, in the depth buffer, uh, we also map this interval to zero one interval. Uh, but if you use a big range, then mapping from a big range to zero one interval is problematic. It called causes this Z fighting problem. So if you have a lot of Z values, a, a big range, then you will have some uh, squeezing. Let me demonstrate it here better like this. So if this is, so this is the best scenario where I have a lot of Z values to be mapped into zero one interval. So see all these, a lot of Z values, this half they map to the, same interval here vertically but here for the same size of interval vertical i have less numbers to deal with then obviously there are there will be problems here right because all these numbers are squeezed into the interval that is as big as the uh, interval here that is used for this less amount of numbers and here it is even worse uh, yeah so that is a problem that fighting uh, the due to this compression uh, the at runtime since everything gets to the same z value same value which pixel to choose it is totally arbitrary so depending on your camera animation whatever you will be seeing arbitrary values either green or yellow uh, red here and that causes a problem
other tests in the on the fragments. So again, rasterizer gave me these fragments. I may draw some of them using that buffer tests that we have seen here. And that fighting a related issue we discussed it. Let me do other tests other than the depth offering. We have scissor test. So this is different than clicking actually. Scissor gives you a mask in the form of a rectangle and you just rasterize. After the rasterization, you have all these green pixels, but after the scissoring, you will be showing only these uh, pixels. And stencil is the extension of that. Uh, you can mask out rectangles. Uh, with scissor rectangle, scissor test. With stencil, you can mask arbitrary fragments. So here, the stencil buffer is the checkerboard, and your output will be like this. So you can use a stencil buffer actually, and we will indeed see this to implement a shadowing algorithm in the next class. So I will not get into that now. Uh, and you can keep your stencil buffer along with your depth buffer. So you, your 32 bit per uh, pixel per depth, you can give eight of it to the stencil buffer. Uh, so it's common to do that. And another operations to do on the fragments of the primitives produced fragments inside the primitives. And those fragments are produced by the rasterizer. So what can I do to those fragments? I can get some blended average color values. So without blending, I put all the red colors as they are closer to the camera. Some depth buffer test happens here. Here, this is the alpha blending. You will use alpha of the red and one minus alpha of the backside blue for the same pixel. So even if the depth buffer gives you different information you will use both pixels but some weights with red some weights with uh, blue so you will see this blended output this is called alpha blending and with that actually we also finish our discussion of the rasterization um, and some primitive drawing all right then we are uh, essentially stopping here yeah. Thanks. See you next week.